in sixteen ninety two accused of witchcraft by enemies superstitious neighbors young girls in the grip of a vengeful hysteria we may take pride in the fact that in a world such as that of the seventeenth century haunted by superstition by dreams of magic and satanic evil we gave way but once and then only briefly to our fears Today in Massachusetts' most famous witch city, witchcraft is honored and embraced in several fashions. The city of Salem, which is home to approximately 40,000 people, welcomes about 900,000 visitors each year, eager to hear the stories that lie within its history. Tourist organizations have created tributes and monuments associated with the witch trials of 1692 to keep the historic witchcraft alive today. Simultaneously, a new face of Salem witchcraft has developed and continues to flourish through the teachings and traditions of Laurie Cabot. At the Witch Museum, a narrated presentation in a dark room explains the process of the witch trials in 1692. From accusations in the community to executions on Gallows Hill, the prominent figures are highlighted in the exhibit for the audience. Rebecca Nurse, even at 71 years old, was accused of witchcraft. Hysterical girls in the community claimed her soul had been seen flying around at night. For months, she was chained down in prison as if it would somehow trap her wandering spirit until she was eventually executed on Gallows Hill. Giles Corey, the most stubbornly courageous of all the accused, refused to speak a word in court in an attempt to protect his land and fortune. As a result, he was sentenced to the medieval torture called pressing, where heavy weights were piled on his chest until he either confessed to the accusation or was pressed to death. Giles Corey, wilt thou not speak and say your nay in thy behalf? More weight! More weight! So be it then! More weight! <laughs> John Proctor, one of the few men who stood steadfast amid the hysteria, had so thoroughly questioned the convictions of the court that his strong opposition raised suspicions and led him to an accusation of witchcraft and execution on the gallows. The story of these figures contribute to the appeal and fascination with the Salem witch trials that brings back such an abundance of tourists each year, keeping the history of the witch city alive. Beneath the gables of Jonathan Corwin's home on Essex Street lie stories that represent the values of early Puritan communities. As magistrate of petty crimes, Corwin was responsible for dealing with the initial accusations of witchcraft in Salem. As the severity of the accusations increased, Corwin became a judge on the trials that ultimately executed 20 individuals accused of witchcraft. The suspicions that led to accusations were based on intangible evidence. Early Puritan communities had the mindset that they were their brother's keepers. They lived to worship God's work. The suspicions and accusations stirred up the community, causing them to believe that the devil was among them, and it was everyone's job to rid the community of the impurity. While the fits or episodes that were reported and labeled as witchcraft were associated with the devil, other alchemy and magic that was practiced for healing purposes during the time sparked no suspicions. The sensitivity and vulnerability people felt when the devil was involved contributed to the hysteria in 1692.
she wanted this was for what her goal was from the very beginning, and that was to create a safe place for witches to be able to come and practice and um, not be, uh, have to be feared by anything, that it was a place for people to come and be educated on what witchcraft and witches really were, and that it wasn't what society uh, typically made us and or what Hollywood and movies actually made us. Laurie's thought to the design of the store was actually the uh, four seasons and the elements. So you'll see different decorations with um, earth, air, fire, water, and fall, winter, spring, and summer. Laurie starts with first degree. It teaches you the science of witchcraft, putting yourself into what we call alpha level or what is most commonly known as a meditative state. And once you're in that meditative state, which is lowering your free, uh, your self frequency to the frequencies around you, because uh, everything has a frequency that you tap into, um, it teaches you how to do that um, on a conscious level, really using your alpha level, your meditation state, to enhance your own personal magic and your own personal psyche. And second degree is taking everything that you learned in first degree, the science, and adding it to the art of witchcraft, which is using the tools. So that would be your chalice, your mithami, your um, paten, your wand, your crystals, your crystal ball, all of those different tools that witches use. It's encompassing those together to enhance your magic. You learn how to cast a circle that you would continue to cast over the course of your, that you choose to do magic. Um, and in that, what we call, consider that to be sacred space, and you do all your magic in that sacred space. At the end of your second degree, you're considered a priest or a priestess within the tradition. Laurie has you wait a year and a day before you would move on to what we consider third degree. And the reason why she has you wait the year and the day is you've learned all this magic in first and second degree. Now it's time to go out and practice it and get to understand your what you actually can do with that magic. Then you can sign up for third degree, which is actually a year and a day commitment. Um, it is the best time of your life and it is the hardest time of your life. You learn more science, you learn more art, and you also encompass the mythology of it. And it's really considered um, learning about the religion aspect of, the, of witchcraft. So witchcraft is considered a religion. We have eight Sabbaths or holidays. Um, we start with Samhain, then we go to Yule, then we go to Invulc, then we go to Spring Equinox or Ostara, Beltane, Midsummer, then we go to Lamas, then we go to Mavin. At the end of the third degree, um, you are considered to be a third degree um, high priest or priestess, and then you petition Lori to be uh, initiated into the Cabot tradition. And if you are accepted, then there is a beautiful, wonderful ceremony that happens, um, which is also a, an event or a ritual, and it is a circle. Uh, different things happen in there which you cannot disclose because um, it is a private ceremony. And then from there, you go on to um, whatever you feel is necessary. Some people go on to teach, some people go on to just embracing the magic, um, and they continue to come back and help um, the next classes with their rituals. The workshops are um, offered by our high priest and priestesses of the tradition, along with Lari. They are offered on all different types of subjects, making potions, candle magic, um, stones, fairy um, workshops, dream workshops. Um, we have one coming up on um, making your Yule ornament um, and uh, working with peppermint. And every person that teaches here is a Cabot witch. They're all um, taught by Laurie and all of the curriculum they actually have to present by Laurie and she approves all the workshops that are taught.